the glory to Thee. who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls a good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever to ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, to two ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us, and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudetu Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to another week of preparation for the Holy Sacrifice. <clears throat> this is our weekly guild stream for our guild members. You're Right now you're watching a public preview where we discuss three different gospels for the three different major rites of the Holy Church the ancient Latin Mass, the Greek Rite, as well as the new Mass of Paul VI. And we're going to thank God for the providential ruling that he has done throughout the week by discussing the news. And in this edition, of course, the big news is the U.S. presidential election. But when you're talking about some of these topics, we'll have uh, Ratzinger's comments about the shifting Epiphany Sundays which I think is interesting. And one guild member wanted to talk about helping the poor. What policies should we prioritize? Great topic, very important one. And then we'll talk three different aspects of the U.S. presidential election. We'll look at that evidence of the cold civil war. I think it's very interesting, as well as the Catholic vote. And number five, expressing some concerns about the Trump regime, especially this topic right here, which is quite controversial, but needs to be discussed. So we're going to talk about all those things during the Guild portion. If you want the full show, go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. But first, we want to promote. First, how can you help the poor? You can help our Guild member, Leo to avoid homelessness. Right now, we've raised 63% of the total that he needs right now. And so please click the link below to chip in what you can. 5, 10, 15, 25, 50, 100, et cetera. Anything you can do, please help Leo and his family. We would really appreciate it. He would really appreciate it. And then just want to point out this new book, for, and it includes an essay from one of our guild members. It's called The Latin Mass and the Youth. Young Catholics Speak About the Mass of the Ages. Uh, it's from Karakin Hill Press, Catholic Books for Nerdy Intellectuals. That's the uh, uh, byline of this press. Forward by Peter Kwasniewski. And here's the comments here from Carlo. He says this. I wanted to share a new book titled The Latin Mass and the Use, which contains 42 essays from writers ages 12 to 24, myself included. 
and then the forward by Kwasniewski. Seems like a good fit for Priest, a good gift for Priest who might not know much about the TLM. So, congratulations, Carlo, for your publishing this essay in the book. So you can check out the book as well and promote that as a good cause. And then also, I wanted to point out this good news. I just found out about this. This is the Encyclopedia of Catholic Theology, which very much the uh, it's very much goes along with the other big news, which is the the Master Catechism. So we got on the one hand we have the Master Catechism, uh, which is right here. This is the maybe you've already seen this. This is the AI Catechism tool, Master Catechism right here, and uh, that's. So mastercatechism.com put out by Tradivox, very, very good resource. And then the other big resource, which is uh, more living authorities, is the Encyclopedia of Catholic Theology. So my friend, uh, Dr. Matthew Minard, is uh, a part of this. So it's a very exciting thing. Here's their, here's their uh, YouTube channel. So make sure you go and subscribe to them. Uh, they're doing great work. Good Thomas out there. So, um, Dr. Matthew Minard and his friend, Father Kajetan Cuddy. So take a look at that. It's good news for the church. Creating new resources, good content. So that's exciting. So um, I wanted to first talk about Maria's question. Our guild member, she said, preparing, she was asking about preparing for mass while in desolation and having no joy in the faith. It's a very difficult thing to deal with spiritual emotional desolation and in my opinion there's no greater place to go for that than the wisdom of saint ignatius of Loyola. i recently uh, was revisiting these these rules if you're not familiar with them there's these 14 rules of discerning of spirits from saint ignatius of Loyola, and i recently revisited this from dan burke's book spiritual warfare and the discernment of spirits and in this text, he goes through the 14 rules, and then he provides a great commentary to them. And so if you're not familiar, there's these 14 rules, and they're very short. We're going to read a several of them in just a minute. And these rules really give us the tools to deal with desolation and consolation. And one of the most important considerations when you're in desolation is to consider the truth, to think about the truth, because desolation is all about turning your heart towards the lies, the devil. And St. Ignatius points out in rule number nine of his discernment of spirits, quote, the principal reasons why we suffer from desolation are three. The first is because we have been tepid and slothful or negligent in our exercises of piety. And so through our own spiritual fault, spiritual consolation has been taken away from us. The second reason is because God wishes to try us to see how much we are worth and how much we will advance in his service and praise when left without the generous reward of consolations and signal favors. The third reason is because God wishes to give us a true knowledge and understanding of ourselves so that we may have an intimate perception of the fact that it is not within our power to acquire and attain great devotion, intense love, tears, or any other spiritual consolation, but that all this is the gift and grace of God our Lord. God does not wish us to build on the property of other, of another, to rise up in spirit in a certain pride and vainglory and attribute to ourselves the devotion and other effects of spiritual consolation, end quote. So this is a very, very critical, important consideration to think about, to think on the truth, God has brought me into this desolation either to punish me as a good father should, uh, to try me, to test me, to show me myself. Critically important to think about these things. And, and for that reason, we can thank God for the desolation. And that's important, I think, to thank God. Thank you, God. You have come to me worthy of spiritual combat, worthy of this desolation because of your great love for me as a good father. Uh, one way to summarize the rules are, when in desolation, remember consolation. When in consolation, prepare for desolation. So let me say that one more time. When you're in desolation, you need to prepare, or sorry, when you're in desolation, you need to remember the consolation. And when you're in consolation, you need to prepare for desolation. 
And this is how we deal with these things, how how we meditate and, and keep peace of heart in the midst of spiritual ups and downs. Now, I'm going to read the, the previous three rules in, in St. Ignatius where he gives us really practical tips here. The first thing is that you never change your spiritual discipline when you're in desolation because the devils always want you to, they want to give you desolation to cause you to stop your spiritual resolution. So you never change any resolutions that you had previously made when you're in desolation. However, what, here's what you do change. Rule number six. Though in desolation, we must never change our former resolutions. It would be very advantageous to intensify our activity against the desolation. We can insist more upon prayer, upon meditation, and on much examination of ourselves. We can make an effort in a suitable way to do some penance. So in the desolation, we want to increase our zeal. We want to do the resolution we had previously resolved to do, but do it more zealously. Rule number seven, when one is in desolation, he should be mindful that God has left him to his natural powers to resist the different agitations and temptations of the enemy in order to try him. He can resist with the help of God, which always remains, though he may not clearly perceive it. For though God has taken from him the abundance of fervor and overflowing love and the intensity of his favors, nevertheless, he has sufficient grace for eternal salvation. And all of these, all of these considerations are themselves consolations. It's consoling to consider that as a factor. Rule number eight. Here's the last one that I'm going to read. When one is in desolation, he should strive to persevere in patience. This reacts against the vexations that have overtaken him. Let him consider too that consolation will soon return. And in the meantime, he must diligently use the means against desolation, which have been given in the sixth rule. So that zealous zealousness, increasing the zealousness. So how do you prepare for mass when you're in desolation? It's to increase your zeal. Increase your zeal. And consider the the consoling truths that are contained here in these rules. And thank God for the spiritual combat that he has counted you worthy of, that he's given you grace to endure. And think on these things and you can resist the devil's temptations, fight through it. And get through it. So, uh, I hope that helps. It's always helped me for sure. So, uh, let's talk about the Gospels. So, tomorrow is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany resumed, and it's the parable of the cockle and the tares. And I, what I want to do here is uh, read from. So, Ratzinger, Spirit of the Liturgy, page one hundred five. Contains something very interesting, I think, about the resumed Epiphany Sundays. It says this. The liturgical calendar used before the post-conciliar reforms, that is the Latin Mass, contained a strange transferal of the seasons. A use which, of course, had long eluded people's understanding and was interpreted in a much too superficial way. Depending on how late or early Easter fell, the time after Epiphany had to be shortened or lengthened. The Sundays left out after Epiphany had to be moved to the end of the church's year. If one looks carefully at the readings then in use, one finds that the texts are largely taken up with the theme of sowing the seed, which is a metaphor for the seed of the gospel to be scattered throughout the world. Now, these texts and their respective Sundays can be accommodated just as well in the spring as in the autumn. Both seasons are seed time. In the spring, the farmer sows seed for autumn, in autumn for the coming year. Sowing seed always points to the future. It belongs to the waxing year, but also to the waning year, for the waning year also points to a new future. In both seasons, the mystery of hope is at work and reaches its proper depth in the waning year, which leads beyond decline to a new beginning. It would be a great work of enculturation to develop this approach and to bring it into the common consciousness of Christians in the two hemispheres, southern and northern. The South could help the North to d- discover a new breadth and depth in the mystery, thus enabling us all to draw afresh on its richness. I think it's quite remarkable that this the, the shifting of these seed gospels, which are which take place on the fifth Sunday after Epiphany and all those also the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. And also, not only that, there's also one of the Septuagesima readings is also a, a seed, but that all that will always take place in the spring. But I think what's remarkable is that 
there's these seed readings in the seed time in the spring and the seed time in the autumn. But then if you flip it and you go into the Southern hemisphere, right now it's the spring time in the Southern hemisphere. They're, so they're entering into the summer, but it still works for them too, because you still have that spring and summer or spring and autumn seed time. So, but I think that the, the gospel itself, the cockle and the tares, this is a very difficult lesson about full communion. This is a term that gets thrown around. Uh, I don't think it's very often understood. It is a bit more, it's a seriously, cer certainly novel and uh, difficult to understand. But one aspect of this is that we must suffer with the weaker brethren. We must suffer with the weaker brethren in communion. In the gospel, our Lord plants, or uh, the sower plants the, his field, but there is biological terrorism, which is where they were sowing these destructive seeds. And this is a lesson for us that we need to maintain our bond of communion and the peace with our brethren, especially the weaker brethren, especially the sinners. We need to have mercy on our fellow Catholics. This is what Meaning of Catholic is all about, is trying to enter into that fact that we need to maintain this communion, this mercy towards our fellow Catholics. This was the original meaning of the kiss of peace. It was restored in the Novus Ordo. I, it was a good idea in theory, I think, but in practice, unfortunately, it's, it's often rather distracting. But the kiss of peace is still done even in the Latin mass when there's a high mass, which with the um, priest, deacon, and subdeacon, they do the kiss of peace to each other. It's also done in the Greek rite. But the kiss of peace is the fact that we need to forgive each other before we can bring our gift to the altar. And I think this is the, the gospel is a great lesson for that. We really need to maintain peace with each other. And especially it, in our in our November, we, we've really got the opportunity to pray for the the poor souls. We you know we hope that you know the sinners that we see today, the public sinners, the sort of the notorious Catholics like you know Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi, people like that. We hope that they will make it into purgatory, despite so many public sins that they seem to be committing, that they will make it into purgatory and that we can pray for them and that they also too may be saved. Um, so this is a very good lesson that the Lord wants us to bear patiently, uh, the weaker brethren, the sinful brethren, and to not consider ourselves better than them. To not to, to think about when you see there's um, a great text Spiritual text is, um, oh, I can't reach it right now, but it's uh, the uh, um, Humility of Heart by Bergamo. And he talks about how when you see a public sinner, you should consider that you too would sin in that way if not God, God's preventing grace. God, because of God's grace, you were not sinning in that way, but you would if God left you to that. And that goes back to what we talked about with desolation. God could leave his grace, or take his grace away from you, and you would also sin it just as they, perhaps worse. So let us consider this with humility. So in the Greek rite, it is the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. In the Greek rite, they just keep on counting after Pentecost. There's no resumed Sundays after Epiphany. And it's continuing forth with the continuation of the Gospel of St. Luke. And here we come in Luke 10 to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Certainly a powerful parable from St. Luke's gospel. And what particularly struck me was that the fact that the man who asks for the parable or asks for the lesson says, who is my neighbor? And at the end, the Lord says, who proved a neighbor? And he says, the one who showed mercy on him. This is a powerful lesson for us to be merciful to those who are wounded because here's another aspect about sin and the public sinners. Many of these public sinners are sinning because they are wounded. And we can think about the, 
the man who fell among robbers and how he was wounded. And there is a, a deeper wound. There's a spiritual wound, emotional wound. People get wounded. And this is what often will lead to a life of sin are these wounds. So we need to have mercy on these people. And as much as we can, bring them to the hospital, which is the church, the mercy of the church. Also, this week is the beginning of the Pilipivka. The Pilipivka is known as the St. Philip's Fast. And in the Greek rite, this takes place on the, it begins on the day after St. Philip's Feast Day in the, in the Greek rite, which is November 14. So this begins on November 15th and goes all the way to Christmas. So this is the Christmas fast, the nativity fast. In the West, we have various Advent traditions of fasting. And we have, for example, a similar fasting period called St. Martin's Lent. So on Monday is Martin Miss, November 11. So then the fasting begins on November 12th and goes all the way to Christmas. And so I encourage all of you to join in with this fast. You can join the Fellowship of St. Anthony. That's our, our lay sodality of penance for priests and seminarians. I promise you, if you fast for Christmas, your, your Christmas will be unlike any other. Trust me, it'll really change everything. So in the 32nd Dominica Tempus Paranum, in the new rite of Paul VI, we have another sort of repetition of this theme of mercy contrasted with the spirit of the Pharisees, which is unmerciful. The first reading is about Elijah and the widow, but in the gospel, there is a condemnation of the spirit of Pharisees, which is unmerciful. They devour the houses of widows. And as a pretext, recite lengthy prayers, they will receive a very severe condemnation, end quote. And this is, this is the challenge. As for pious Catholics, this is the, as um, St. John Cassian mentions, if, if you have overcome all of the deadly, the seven deadly sins, and you're not falling into mortal sin, then your final battle is against pride and vainglory because you may have overcome various mortal sins, but then you are tempted by the devil to take pride in yourself. And this is what the Pharisees did. They had, for a pretext, they made lengthy prayers, but they failed to have mercy on those who are wounded, like the Good Samaritan did. So, those are our Gospels for this Sunday. Stay tuned. We will talk about all of the news, We'll talk more about uh, the Trump regime, the incoming regime. We'll get all these topics in just a minute. So if you want to subscribe to Meaning of Catholic and get access to the whole Guild community stream, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. Back in a moment. Mm -hmm. 